Support for this podcast and the following message come from Google and Squarespace. When you create a custom domain and a beautiful business website with Squarespace, you'll receive a free year of business email and professional tools from Google. Visit squarespace.com slash Google to start your free trial. Use offer code BUILDIT for 10% off your first purchase. I remember walking down the street completely freaked out with a friend of mine who also went to meetings and I was scared and because I didn't know what I was doing and he said what have you got to lose he said maybe it'll be like one magazine that you make and you can go around and say hey I made this magazine and then you can apply for a job and get a job somewhere or maybe it'll be huge From NPR, it's How I Built This, a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, idealists, and the stories behind the movements they built. I'm Guy Raz, and on today's show, how Sarush Alvi took a small alternative magazine in Montreal and built it into Vice Media, which is, and this is totally mind-blowing, now valued at over $4 billion dollars. So I'm sitting here in the studio, and I'm looking at the website for Vice, and I'm clicking through, you know, it's kind of typical mashup of hard-hitting news, and then you've got the sort of oddball feature. Uh, Like this one, this is the story is a psychologist analyzes the fights couples have in Ikea, which I I think many of us can identify with. Uh, And then you just scroll down a little bit. Uh, There's this one, how majority Muslim countries are handling HIV infections. Uh, and of course, you can you know you can click on plenty of slick videos that, that take you all over the world, like this one, cockfighting in the Canary Islands. Anna Boleyn Dominguez is a Sarah activist, an organization who fights for animal rights in the Canary Islands. I am meeting her because she has arranged to meet Jose Luis Martin, the president of the Canary Islands Cockfighting Federation. Anyway, we know that flashy news websites can die almost as fast as they launch, but for some reason, Vice has stuck around. Its YouTube channel has over a billion views, and it's even won a couple of Peabody Awards, which is super prestigious. But the thing is, Vice's co-founder, Sarush Alvi, he didn't set out to create any of this. In fact, he barely made it out of his 20s alive. I was born in Toronto. Uh, my parents emigrated from from Pakistan um, a couple years before I was born. Right. They are retired academics. My mom taught at McGill and my father at the University of Toronto, although my mom also taught at the University of Minnesota for a while. And so I ended up going to high school in the States. So I heard a lot of, you have to work twice as hard as white people to get anywhere in this world growing up. And did that turn out to be true? (laughs) Um, Yeah. 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 What, What did they want you to be? Well, the two fields that are most respected in in Pakistan, at least when I was growing up, was medicine or engineering. So I think that, you know, in an ideal world, I would have been a doctor. With a with a BA, I'm uh, the black sheep of the family. Everyone has multiple degrees. So, so you went to college in, in Montreal, right? Yes. Were you a good student? I, I was not a good student. I originally went into psychology. I got kicked out of that program. Ended up getting a degree in philosophy. It was a tough slog. I'd come from, you know, a small private school in Minneapolis where I went to high school and going to McGill was just a different vibe. There's a lot of distractions in Montreal. And that's, um, I I guess that's the place where you kind of, you kind of hit a low point, right? Yeah, that's where I bottomed out. When I, you know, finished McGill, it was also with a full-blown heroin habit. And so, I spent a couple of years afterwards kind of looking for a geographic cure, bouncing around, jumping you know, from city to city. Oh, the problem's not with me. It's here, the city, this environment. It's just too decadent and blah, blah, blah. So I ran around, and no matter where I went, I kind of took it with me. Ended up in Eastern Europe, and even there in a remote part of Slovakia, was able to stay strung out for upwards of five years and ended up back in grad school at Toronto studying psychology and, and dropped out. And that's when I really was like, you know, descending in the tailspin, hitting bottom. And when I ended up back in Montreal, it was to go to rehab. How did you know it was time to go to rehab? I couldn't, I couldn't sustain it anymore. I couldn't keep the 
the web of lies going. Yeah. It was this kind of double life I'd been leading. You know, no one really knew that I was, um, you know, a heroin addict. So, so how did your your friends and family react? Again, my parents are um, conservative Muslim immigrants, but progressive as well, you know, as far as Pakistani immigrants go. But they thought I had the occasional drink. They didn't know the extent of what was going on with me. And when they found out, I think my mom went into a bit of a depression. My brother wanted to kill me. My dad had a heart attack. I don't know if the, the heart attack was directly related, but I don't think it helped. It was bad. It was a really bad time. And so my mental state at the time was was not good. I, I did go into a bit of a depression at that point. I went, I had to go to rehab twice. You know, the first time it didn't stick. And, you know, like they found out that I was using again. And it's the only time in my life that my mom's ever hit me. And at that point, I remember that was my bottom. So it's like early 94 uh, on a waiting list to get into a, a treatment center. No friends. No, I wasn't speaking much. I was kind of, you know, kicking dope in my parents' house on a waiting list to get into a treatment center. Like, life was not great at that point. How long did it take you before you you started to sort of feel like you were regaining control over your life? Well, after I came out of the treatment center, you know, I was so scared that I was going to relapse. And it was just like I was going to meetings, just going to, you know, NA meetings at the time. Um you know, they say you should go to 90 meetings in 90 days when you first stop drinking or doing drugs. And, and I was going to like two meetings a day. I, I got my own little apartment in Montreal and was on welfare. And I just rode on my bike from meeting to meeting all day, every day. And it was um, <clears throat> during that time that I actually started thinking about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I had had this idea that I wanted to work for a magazine. Hmm. And you wanted to write about like what, like music or pop culture or like what, what I didn't even get that far <laughs> <laughs> something I felt like I wanted to talk about those things yes music culture uh, I felt like there was just a lot happening that wasn't being talked about when I picked up magazines yeah. the depraved underground yeah. culture that, that I was obsessed with was not being re- covered properly in the alt weeklies so, so was it like a realistic possibility could you just go and, and work for a magazine or, or a newspaper no, I don't think so. I had no experience doing it. My only writing that I'd ever done was academic, you know, writing in university. And when I was going to these meetings in Montreal, someone came up to me, and out of the blue, they started a conversation with me, and they said, do you have a sponsor? I said, no. And they said, well, I'll be your sponsor. And this then is they some said, random dude who was... A random dude walked up to me. After the Narcotics <laughs> Anonymous meeting. He was in the meeting with me. The meeting ended, and he came up to me. He said, what are, you, what are you doing? Like, are you working? I said, no, I'm not working. I can't even get a job volunteering anywhere. I tried to volunteer at this place, and they, they wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't let me. And out of the blue, he said, have you ever thought about writing? He didn't know me. I was like, actually, yeah. And he's like, well, I know a place. I'll take you there tomorrow. So he took me to this place, these Haitians in Montreal who had a, a bilingual magazine going called Image Interculturel, and it was becoming French only, and they wanted to start an English magazine. And he vouched on my behalf. He uh, just begged, basically like, oh, this is the guy you want. He's really good. Yeah. That's, <laughs> and, he barely, and he barely knew you. He barely knew me. He'd worked there before, but he was like this, this heaven-sent angel who just was like put in my path. And it opens up a whole conversation about like, do I believe in God? Do I believe in a higher power? Do I believe in Allah? All this kind of stuff. Yeah. And... For me, that whole story is like this proof of existence moment for me in my life. Something greater than me put me there and in this place where this guy just walked up to me and chose me to talk to me and happened to know a place that was looking for a guy. To start an (laughs) English language magazine in Montreal. Exactly. So what was the magazine called and how did it start? So so I went in for this meeting and he vouched for me and said that he'd known me a long time, that I was going to work really hard. I didn't have a lot of experience, but that he thought I could do this thing. And they they said, okay. And they gave me a desk, a fax machine, a phone, and a computer. And I started this process of, you know, making a magazine. And um, all right, Voice of Montreal is the name that I came up with at the time. Yeah. And I had no idea what I was doing. I just... But I knew a few people around town and started this kind of recruitment process of finding writers to write in the magazine. And and I remember walking down the street 
completely freaked out with a friend of mine, and I was scared and because I didn't know what I was doing. And he said, what have you got to lose? He said, maybe it'll be, you know, like one magazine that you make, and you can go around and say, hey, I made this magazine, and then you can apply for a job and get a job somewhere, or maybe it'll be huge. And, like, that conversation on the street, that was a huge moment for me because that gave me the kind of strength to continue on when I was, like, overwhelmed and could barely tie my shoes straight coming out of a treatment center. Like, that was a mess. Um, and I owe him a lot because he didn't, he didn't realize what he was doing at the time, but he gave me this kind of strength to keep marching forward. So you get to the magazine. What, like, what kind of publication was it? It was a 16-page newsprint magazine. But you were like the, the kind of the really like the poor, poor stepchild of the two big alt-weeklies in Montreal. Like you guys were totally like a joke compared to those. We were the laughing stock. Yeah. Because it was a, a shrinking English market. Okay. So it's, you know, it's a bilingual city. So there were four alt-weeklies already, two French ones and two English ones. And then we came on the scene and the English market is actually shrinking. There wasn't enough advertising to sustain those two, let alone a third one, uh, it didn't make any economic sense. You know, but I really believe that there was an audience there for what we were talking about. So so you guys were covering like what? Like the sort of the like alternative scene in Montreal, like skaters and... Punk shows punk and, and okay. hip hop yeah. and it was music, like underground music. Yeah. And I wrote this terrible editorial about the search for authenticity and the need for like creating real content but I stand by that editorial like I, I hope to God nobody ever finds that and publishes it again because it it was awful but it, it, the spirit of what we do today is was was there so you are um, so like you are basically the editor-in-chief of this uh, magazine in your early 20s voice of Montreal and like who did you who are some of the people you brought in to help you start it and create it um you know one of my friends from college he connected me to a bunch of different artists and also to different writers and one of these writers was a guy named Gavin McInnes and he was funny and had a, a comic book called Pervert and so I asked him to become my assistant editor and the, I think I asked him to be my comics editor whatever that means <laughs> so it was his job to find the different comic artists around town and put together a comics page and what about Shane Smith who's now kind of like the public face of, of Vice I guess how did he how did he get involved so Shane and Gavin grew up together in Ottawa. And the first night we met, he was just like, he literally said, you're my new best friend. What happened? Like, he, he was drunk and on acid as well. I should, I should qualify this. Yes, right. <laughs> he was in a bar called the Biff Tech. Gavin and I had been driving around the city all day distributing the magazine that had just come out. And we'd finished our rounds and went to the bar to meet Shane. And he was in there. He'd been waiting for a couple hours for us. And... Uh, by himself, somehow managed to procure some psychedelics and was drunk. And I was, of course, you know, sober and tired. And I walk in, there's a, a drunk man on psychedelics like, who was like, oh, you're from Pakistan, you must love cricket. And then was like pretending to like bowl like balls at me. And, and, you, you and know, you're throwing... like, this guy wants to be our ad sales dude? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he had worked for, for Greenpeace before and he could actually sell. Hmm. You know, with with Greenpeace, he had, you know, he raised a lot of money for them, and and in Eastern Europe, he was involved with some activities where he was making lots of money. Oh, I see. Okay. And so right. he knew how to make money. Okay. He's some activities. Right? Some I activities. See, okay. I'm going to leave it at right. that. And he was good at making money, and he could, you know, sell rattlesnake boots to a rattlesnake. And so then it was me, Gavin, and Shane working in this office with the Haitians and wow. we were there for like three four months and but it wasn't working out because we weren't getting paid the commissions on the ads that we were selling yeah, like how were you being paid at all well we were on welfare <laughs> okay I got you fine <laughs> and so we talked to the, the the Haitians and said you know it's it's time for us to to leave and we came up with this thing where we said the village voice has a trademark on the word voice and they're suing us and forcing us to change our name. Because you guys were the voice of Montreal. Yes. We told the world that we were being sued by the village voice, and that's why we had to change the name to Vice. So you, you basically made this thing up about the village voice to, to generate publicity? Yeah. 
And it was a complete lie? It was a total lie. And, ah, I got you. And that's why we dropped the O in, in how we started Vice. So you basically created a, a new magazine. We, we created a new magazine. Because you didn't own The Voice of Montreal. Exactly. So what did you do at that point? Did you like go to find a new office, or did you start working at your apartment? Or That's a good question. We, we got a, a new loft, uh, in old, like not too far from the original office. Uh, I borrowed five grand from my parents. Gavin borrowed five grand from his parents, and Shane got five thousand dollars worth of computers from his dad. His dad worked in, you know, IT or something, and and so it was with that, you know, ten thousand dollars Canadian that we started Vice. Okay, so this is now like like I guess the mid nineties, uh, and and you guys have become Vice. What what was a magazine like at that point? Like, what did you cover? We really wanted to, again, it's such an overused word, guy, but it's um, it's a good one. Authenticity, like how do you create real content? And we hadn't been to journalism school, yeah. So the way to do that is to get as close to the source as possible. And if we were going to write an article about the prostitution community in Montreal, let's get the prostitutes to write that story. And let's go out with pimps as they drive around and interview them. And so we created this really raw magazine. There were a lot of typos, but it was alive. Like, I think the words kind of jumped off the page, and it was kind of shocking stuff. And yeah. and yeah. we were so, you know, freedom of, of the press was such a big deal. Like, we're so anti-censorship that even if you, you know, are, are viewed towards advertising, if you buy that page of advertising, you own that page. You can do whatever you want with it. And so we had these... Sp- skateboard companies from Southern California that had like, you know, porn stars in their ads, nude porn stars in the ads. So the magazine all of a sudden has these crazy articles with lots of nudity you know, advertising skateboard companies called serial killer skateboards or whatever. You know, so it was this whole weird little take on American culture that was coming from Montreal. So we were sending this magazine to San Francisco, Chicago, L.A., New York, and the Americans were eating it up. So were you guys making money like pretty soon after you launched or were you still like bootstrapping it and barely you know, keep We it? were bootstrapping it because we couldn't afford to have debt. We didn't we couldn't get a loan. So we just printed copies based on how much we were yeah. selling and advertising and it's what we call this kind of punk rock capitalism. Just be really aggressive, be really ambitious and you can't have debt. Those are the rules that we lived by until we took our investment for the first time. And that was when? That was in 98, um, when we sold 25% of the company to a guy named Richard Solwinski. So he, he was like uh, a, some, a rich guy who just wanted to invest in the magazine? Because it, it seems like kind of a crazy investment at the time. So Shane and I had realized at that point that we needed some help if we wanted to grow the magazine. And we're like, who would invest in us? Like, maybe Larry Flint would. And, but there was a guy in Montreal uh, named Richard Solwinski who had a software company called Discreet Logic that he'd sold to Autodesk for several hundred million dollars. And he was starting to buy media properties. And we had been interviewed by the French Daily in Montreal called La Presse. And so we said in, in that interview in La Presse that he was interested in buying us. And he then read it. <laughs> And then had his office contact us a few days later and said, uh, he wants to meet you guys. Who are you guys? He has no idea who you are, but apparently he's interested in buying you guys. So we met him and and did a deal very quickly to sell 25% of the company to him. That that must have been like a crazy amount of money for you guys at the time. Crazy. Yeah. This could have only happened in Montreal. There was no due diligence that took place. It was literally one meeting with him at a restaurant that he he loved, and so he bought it and moved it into the basement of his office, and he brought out a bottle of Jack Daniels and kind of forced Shane to drink a bunch of it, and then at the end of the meeting said, I want to, to buy a piece of your magazine, come back to me in a week and tell me how much, and, and don't try and gouge me. And so we, we left his office and spent a week going, like, how much do we value our company for? How did like, you even figure that out? It was kind of arbitrary. You just pulled it from the air. Yeah, we pulled it from the air and came up with this number. Somehow justified that it was a million bucks. And he read it. It was all on one piece of paper. It said the price of ice. He read it and he said, that's a lot of money. And then he signed it. And they whisked us upstairs and they wrote us checks. And I think his advisors were like, this is such a bad idea. (laughs) This shouldn't be happening. But again, no due diligence, no like accounting, nothing. 
and his office was actually walking distance from our office and we went out it was springtime in Montreal and we literally did somersaults in the grass when we left you had 250,000 bucks now yeah, yeah. so so yeah. with that money you were able to scale the magazine we were able to move to New York When we come back, the story of Vice's move to New York and its almost complete collapse. It's how I built this from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Stay with us. Hey, everyone. Just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who help keep this podcast going. First, to Casper. They're an online mattress retailer. The Casper mattress is designed and developed in the USA and engineered for comfort. They use two technologies, latex foam and memory foam, to give just the right amount of sink and bounce. And they have a risk-free trial. Try out your Casper mattress for 100 nights with free delivery and returns, along with a special offer for listeners to this show Go to casper.com slash built and use the promo code built to redeem $50 toward a Casper mattress. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks also to Hyatt. Hyatt believes the modern business traveler is changing the face of business. Today's business travelers don't settle. They're refusing mediocrity. They're reinventing their careers, bending titles, and breaking new ground. And because they've changed, business travel is changing too. And that's why there's a place and a house where good enough isn't. Hyatt Place and Hyatt House Hotels. You've come too far to settle now, so book your stay today at Hyatt.com slash why settle. Hey, really quickly, before we get back to the show, I want to invite you to come see how I built this live on stage at the Now Hear This podcast festival on Friday, October 28th in beautiful Anaheim, California. Now Hear This is a three-day festival of your favorite podcasts, October 28th through the 30th, with shows like NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour, Dinner Party Download, and WTF with Mark Marin. We will be doing a live episode of How I Built This on Friday, October 28th. So if you can only make it for one day, make sure it's Friday or you'll miss out on our show. To get tickets and information about the full lineup, go to nowhearthisfest.com. Hope to see you there. It's How I Built This from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. So it's 1999. Gavin, Shane, and Sarush have a $250,000 check and a dream to become much, much bigger. We always had aspirations to talk about the world and other things as well. And we had started building up a stable of writers that was international. But we had a ceiling. Becoming national in Canada wasn't good enough for us. We aspired for more. And we thought, okay, we have to go. The only, you know, if we want to become bigger, we need to go to either New York or London or LA. And, and so what did your investor, Richard Zalwinski, want you guys to, to do with the money? He had this vision. So he had Vice, and then he had a magazine called Shift, which was like a spin meets wired kind of magazine for a slightly older crowd. And then he had another company called Halo 46, which was kind of a luxury goods high-end brand. And he wanted all three of these brands to diversify and become multi-channel brands that was going to be tied into a big e-commerce platform, and he was going to take it all public. And and so that's what we did with the money. We we built a fashion division, a film division, a TV division, a music division, and you should have a brick and mortar presence for your fashion division. And so he had like this huge vision that you guys weren't even thinking about. Like you were you were thinking more just a, a zine. Yeah, and he he was he was kind of ahead of the curve. It was kind of like an Amazon kind of thing. And like we came in and we actually executed his business plan. And, like and you actually started a fashion label? Yeah. And we had, we had four four clothing stores. Like you got designers to make like Vice kind of fashion or? Yeah. But we also sold a lot of other lines. All the lines that we were, were advertising in the magazine, we sold their clothes. Uh, we, we realized by doing it that we don't want to sell pants for a living, yeah. that we're better at making content, that that's really what we want to do. But it served its purpose at the time. So at that point, were things like really like starting to move? No. Very quickly, Solwinski kind of ran out of money and, and retreated to Nantucket. And this is when the, the dot-com bubble bursts. Exactly. So what where did that leave you guys? 
it left us, you know, high and dry. You like, had stores in New York. You had an office space in Manhattan, and you had employees, and you had no money coming in. One hundred percent. It was bad. It was it was a bad time. So what happened to Zolwinski? We found out that Richard was in Nantucket at his house, and so we rented a car and drove up there. We took the ferry over and called him from a payphone, and he picked us up and was very surprised that we were there. We hadn't had any contact with him for, you know, like a month or something like that. What was going on? Was he running out of money? Yeah. So we went to his house, and we're like, what's going on? And he said, "It's, it's over. The money's gone. I'm done. I can't put any more money into this. So all of a sudden we're like, well, what do we do? And so then we came back and we that's when we moved to Brooklyn. We left his office. I unscrewed the mirrors out of the bathroom and took the plants and the desks and filing cabinets <laughs> that we still have. Uh, I'm still using the same filing cabinet that I stole from that office on 27th Street. It, ha- it all happened so quickly. We And we sold more equity to Solwinski. So he ended up taking over control of the whole company at that point. Okay, so wait. Before the company basically fell apart, he he bought the entire company from you? Yeah, and, and like we did a s- stock trade, you know, our shares for his company, which was called Normal Net, and they're like, you're worth $44 million now. So we went from being on welfare to theoretically being worth $40 million bucks in a very short amount of time to it just all collapsing and being broke again. And all of a sudden, we have these stores and we have debt for the first time. And Zolwinski still owned, completely owned the brand at that point? Yeah, and, and then we bought it back from him. How did you do that? For pennies on the dollar, Shane did a deal. And, you know, he he was nice to us in a way, like, even though he put us out of business, but he was... He he agreed to sell the company back to us, and we did a deal with him. I can't remember for exactly how much, but for for we got a deal to buy the company back. So we got our equity back. How how were you able to raise the money to, to buy him out? We took. I borrowed money from my brother. Wow. We all kind of borrowed the money. So you guys buy the buy back the company. It's yours again. Essentially, you've got to completely rebuild it. Um. So what did you do? Did you like – I mean you've got these these shops. You've got the film division and this division and the e-commerce. Like what do you do? We went back to doing things how we had originally done them, which is we can't have debt. You know, We owed all this money to these Italian like fashion companies who were ma- manufacturing our clothes. And Shane went and took meetings with all of them and figured out how to reduce the debt. Hmm. So he's like, well, I know you want 200000 I've got twenty. Take it or leave it. Sue me or take the twenty grand. And that's how we worked our way out of yeah. that debt in that time. And we just went back to eating beans and rebuilding and and doing things how we'd always done them before we took investment. And so that was, you know, like a really valuable lesson and being able to buy the company back and have a second chance was was huge. All right, so in in the midst of all this, you you were still putting out the magazine, right? Yeah, the magazine was hot. It was still doing well, like from a cultural level. Maybe not making a lot of money. It was profitable because it had to be. We weren't paying people much money, and we weren't distributing millions and millions of copies, but it was getting out there, and it was making an impact and getting some recognition. And you're still mainly covering, like, counterculture and and, and stuff like that. But when occasionally we would have photojournalists that would come in who had been in Afghanistan or Jamaica and done something with, like, you know, gangsters in Jamaica, and we would run their photos. Like, we tried, but we didn't have the resources. We didn't have a network. We weren't doing reporting in the traditional sense at all. Um, It was a culture magazine that occasionally did some kind of newsy photojournalism. If it was gritty and raw. But in 2006, that was when everything changed for us when we picked up cameras. Video cameras. Yeah. Uh, We took a meeting with MTV. And they said, if we gave you money to make a DVD, what would you do? And we said it would be like Jackass meets 60 Minutes. 
And that worked. We were speaking their language, you know. And, and so they gave us money to make a DVD. And so we said, okay, let's go make the travel, the Vice Guide to Travel DVD. And so where did you go? I went to Pakistan. We traveled to this area three years ago when we wanted to visit a massive illegal arms market believed to be a source of weapons for the Taliban. We just kind of recreated what we'd done in the magazine. Is this loaded? Yes, this is loaded, but they, they locked. They locked it. Where's the lock? But it was the first time we were telling stories in a different medium, and it was like a eight-minute segment. We stuck it on this DVD. That segment eventually ended up on the homepage of, of CNN, and, and they treated it as news. Sarush Alvi, the co-founder of Vice, took a trip to the country's most volatile city, Karachi. I mean, it's crazy to think about it, right? Because if you if you go back to the early 2000s and the late 90s, there were a lot of really cool magazines. I mean, there were a lot of really cool, like, zines and people doing cool stuff. And But for some reason, you guys made it. Like, why do you think that is? I mean, how, how was it that, that Vice became Vice and those other magazines didn't? We refused to die. <laughs> Again, we're survivors, right? And we always found a way to do a deal, even when times were, were dark and it was hard. You know, we found a way. And we diversified at the right time. So we would have some other deal that would keep the lights on while the magazine is going through a downturn and we're having a hard time selling ads. Go out and do a big deal with, with Viacom that will keep us going for another eight months, you know, and then do a deal with, you know, a private equity firm and get some money from there. And, and, and so, but it is crazy that all those magazines are gone for the most part. And they were all so big and, and we were like the stepchildren and, and they disappeared. How do you feel when people say uh, that vice is, is, like self-indulgent, you know, and it's all about the reporter and it's not really news because, I mean, you, you have heard that, right? I mean, you, you hear that from mainstream news organizations. Sure. So how do you feel about it? I mean, do you do you get defensive? Do you just ignore it or, or, or do you think maybe they're right? You know, we ignore it for the most part. <laughs> I think they're often wrong or they're, they're basing it on one thing that we did way back in the day or whatever. But I do believe strongly in how we create our content and the the importance of having a point of view and, and subjectivity. Yes, we didn't go to journalism school, but I think that there's um, a, a place for the type of content that we're making. And we're, we're winning Peabody Awards, you know, for all the people that are taking shots at us. I, I also think those accusations are coming from a place of where people are feeling threatened as well, you know while Al Jazeera America is shutting down and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but, of course, we, we have made content that isn't great, that isn't perfect. There are mistakes, but we're learning. We're going to school in public, you know, in, 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 in a way. And I do think there's a lot that they teach in journalism school that we've tried to incorporate into the content we make to be accountable. Yeah. H have there ever been stories that you guys have done that you wish you didn't do? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about any of them without fear of being sued or? No, I mean, like, the, there's there's the one, the, the McAfee story. I don't know if you remember that one. Uh, the, the guy who did the... Um, he was the guy who did the uh, the antivirus software. He was, like, on the run from the police a couple of years ago. Exactly, where we kind of embedded with him and... and uh, released a photo where we didn't scrub the geo tag from it. So people, we basically exposed exactly where he was when he was on the run, which we obviously weren't trying to do. And everybody celebrated that mistake. You know, everybody being <laughs> all the competition in in the other, you know, news organizations that you know, Vice. Oh, they're trying to do this reporting and, and they're making rookie mistakes. So that was, you know, learning a lesson in, in public the hard way. Um, but for the most part, you know, I, I don't have a lot of regrets about the, the content that we make and have made because it's got us to this point today. Yeah. I mean, over time, you guys have attracted a lot of investment. Um, and today, uh, Vice is valued at over $4 
billion dollars. You started this like English language version of a Haitian French <laughs> magazine in 1994. Like, how crazy is that? I mean, it takes me back to that time on the street where my buddy said to me, he said, maybe you'll make one copy of the magazine or maybe it'll be huge one day. And in my gut at that time, I felt like, oh, maybe this could be huge. I couldn't define it. I didn't know that this is how it was going to manifest itself and that we would employ, you know, 2,000 people and and be valued at over $4 billion. But, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Sir Javi lives in New York. He no longer edits or manages anyone at the magazine. In fact, today... Sarush basically picks his stories and travels around the world to tell them. He's got a new series. It's called Terror. That show drops October 11th on ViceNews.com and on Viceland. Hey, thanks for listening to the show this week. If you want to find out more or listen to previous episodes, you can go to howibuiltthis.npr.org. And if you have a chance, please subscribe to our show through iTunes and let other people know about it. You can also write us directly at hibt at npr.org or tweet us. That's at How I Built This. Our show is produced this week by Ramtin Arablui, who also composed the music. Thanks also to Neva Grant, Sanaz Meshkinpur, and Jeff Rogers. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to How I Built This from NPR. Are you the only one at Vice without sleeve tattoos? I, you know, it's true. I have no tattoos. I'm a minority. Hey, if you're still listening, one more thing. This month, there are two more presidential debates on October 9th and October 19th. And after the debates, the NPR Politics Podcast is inviting you to skip the cable news hangover and get caught up with them. They'll have new podcast episodes the morning after both debates, so you'll know what happened and what it means by the time you get to work or class. Whatever your morning routine, make the NPR Politics Podcast.